First of all, I just wanted to thank David Smith for so kindly inviting me to come here today to attempt to fill the unfillable shoes of the brilliant Brian Earp, <laughs> with whom I have just spent the summer in Geneva, also co-writing co um, a journal article. The one that we're... <clears throat> excuse me, I'm quite unwell today. My kid's unwell. It's been a bit of a, a mission <laughs> getting here today. I'm very glad I made it. Um, but just forgive me if I have to cough and splutter a little bit. Um, so the, the paper that, that Brian Earp and I are working on is quite ambitious in its scope. Um, we're trying to write a paper about the future of policy in relation to female and male genital alteration. And today what I want to do is to give you a snapshot um, in half an hour of what we're doing in that paper. The first part um, is to really identify and critique the current contrasting policies that exist in relation to female and male genital alteration. Um, and then we're suggesting and evaluating um, some benefits um, and disadvantages of some alternative policies. So turning to the first part. So in thinking about current policies, I'm not simply restricting the analysis here to law, um, but to a broader set of official statements, um, projects that are receiving or not receiving support, um, and those types of things. And Brian and I are focusing this analysis on two different levels. The first is at a global level. So we've looked quite closely um, at the policies of some international and transnational organisations like the World Health Organisation and the UN. So, for example, um, there was an interagency statement from 12 international bodies in 2008. Many of you may be familiar with it, which was about eliminating FGM. So we've been critiquing those kinds of documents. Um, and we're also looking at Western States, so liberal democratic states, in particular the UK and the US, with which we're both familiar. And I'm sure, as most of you in the room already know, um, these policies at both these levels tend to um, focus on eliminating um, what they describe as female genital mutilation or FGM, which is usually conceived of within a human rights framework. Um, whereas, by contrast, there tends to be a policy um, of either tolerating or, in fact, in some instances, actually encouraging um, male circumcision, which is usually seen within the context um, of global health. And that's because, essentially, male circumcision is generally seen by policymakers in these health and human rights worlds um, as a, either a benign or, in fact, a beneficial procedure, whereas, by contrast, female genital mutilation is seen as something that is bad and barbaric, that is a manifestation of the um, attempt to try to control and contain female sexuality within the bounds of marriage. So it's not surprising, therefore, um, that the two are treated differently in policy as a result of these contrasting perceptions. And that's why when the anthropologist Kirsten Bell, for example, um, tried to talk comparatively um, about these issues, she says that she was met with the following response. How dare I mention these two entirely different operations in the same breath? How dare I compare the innocuous and beneficial removal of the foreskin with the extreme mutilations enacted against females in other societies? Now, the upshot of these contrasting perceptions and these contrasting policies is that there is now a situation where what is tolerated and encouraged or criminalised um, does not correspond to the extent of, of the invasiveness or the severity of harm caused by the particular procedures. So what you can see in um, this chart up here um, are the range of female and um, male genital cutting practices according to um, what many would regard as increasing severity. So in the bottom you have um, what Michael was talking about earlier, those categorised by the World Health Organization as um, FGM type 4, so that's pricking, piercing, incising, scraping. Um, then through to um, male genital cutting, the removal of the prepus beyond the glands, and then the complete prepus removal, which is the most common form um, of circumcision globally. Um, and then right through to cauterization, subincision, infibulation, and then removal of all tissues, including the scrotum. <clears throat> 
So as you can see, the, the bottom um, types are a criminal offence in the US and the UK, um, and they're banned by the United Nations and subject to a policy of elimination. By contrast, um, a type of procedure that, as Sir James Mumby said, would be almost irrational not to compare <laughs> with those other procedures. They are legal um, everywhere and are mostly unregulated. So um, what the anthropologist Zachary Andrus has said is that by collapsing all of the many different types of procedures performed into a single set for each sex, categories are created that do not accurately describe any situation that actually occurs anywhere in the world. Now, when Sir James Mumby, who I'll try not to talk about too much, um, ruled that if um, type 4 FGM could be considered a significant harm, as in his judgment it does, then male circumcision also had to be considered a significant harm. He then sought to rescue the distinction um, between the two, partly through um, the reasonable parenting analysis that Michael so brilliantly described, um, but also with recourse to two different arguments that I think many of you will have come across if and when you have tried to compare these two types of procedures. And the pushback essentially falls into two categories. One um, is with refrain to health benefits, the health benefits defence, um, and that runs along the following lines. Essentially that FGM confers no health benefits, whereas male circumcision is hygienic and has prophylactic benefits, um, and therefore FGM should be eliminated, male circumcision should be tolerated or even encouraged. And then there's the culture versus religion argument, which Mumby also referred to in his judgment. And that essentially is that FGM has no basis in any religion, it's just a cultural practice, um, and therefore deserving of a lesser status, um, whereas male circumcision is religiously mandated and therefore should be privileged um, in some way. So I just want to quickly um, point out some of the flaws, as I see it, with those distinctions before I then move on to um, explaining why I think the current policy should be replaced um, by policies that don't relate to sex. So in relation to health benefits, um, there's a simple logic here. Um, so just turning first to FGM. The simple logic runs that essentially if you remove a particular part of the body, that part of the body cannot be susceptible to disease. So if you were to remove the breast buds of young girls, um, those young girls could not go on to develop breast cancer, for example. So it seems quite logical, therefore, that if you were to remove parts of female genitalia, leaving aside the risks and complications of performing that surgery, you would in fact eliminate those particular body parts from becoming diseased. Now, of course, it's illegal to find this out, um, and it would be criminal assault um, if anybody tried to do so without consent. Nevertheless, that seems very logical. Um, and, and certainly it's the case that, as um, Stephen Svoboda and Rob Darby um, have said, um, doctors in Egypt, they were citing here, this is in their article, Arose by Any Other Name, from 2008. Um, there's a perception that female genital cutting um, lowers the risk of vaginal cancer, nervous anxiety, that there are fewer infections from microbes gathering under the hood of the clitoris, and it provides protection against herpes and genital ulcers. And there's also some evidence that there could be a protective effect from performing FGC. Um, the Stallings and Kurogendo um, from their study in Tanzania found a significant and perplexing inverse association between reported female circumcision and HIV seropositivity. Um, it's interesting to note that um, some studies that have found these kinds of findings have not actually been published. There's been resistance to that because it flies in the face of the claim that FGM carries no health benefits. Um, so as Brian Earp has written elsewhere, um, this apparent distinction, therefore, between FGM and male circumcision in relation to health benefits um, is largely a consequence of the current legal treatment and cannot be used to justify differential treatment by the law. Um, and thus, every time one sees the claim that FGM has no health benefits, a claim that has become something of a mantra for the WHO, one should read this as saying, we don't actually know if certain minor sterilised forms of FGM have health benefits because it is unethical and would be illegal to find out. So turning now to male circumcision, um, the claim is that male circumcision should be encouraged um, um, or tolerated because it's hygienic um, and has prophylactic benefits. And there's evidence here that goes against that claim too. So what the scientific data uh, to this point seems to suggest is that in actual fact, there is a modest reduction in the absolute as opposed to the relative risk of a male who is circumcised contracting certain 
often quite rare um, diseases. Now, most of those diseases can be prevented or can be treated without the need for surgery. So thinking here about urinary tract infections, UTIs, that can be easily treated with antibiotics. And some of those diseases um, only apply to adults um, who are sexually active rather than to children who are not sexually active. So, for example, if one is thinking about reducing one's susceptibility to um, sexually transmitted infections, um, that is something that would only apply to adults rather than children and therefore cannot be used as an argument for circumcising infants. And there's also a question here about benefits versus net benefits. And what I mean by that is that even if there is a specific benefit that can, that can accrue from removing um, the male foreskin, that has to be weighed up um, against the risks and com potential complications um, of removing that piece of the body um, and from the individual's uh, psychosexual experiences as a result. So the next argument that's been used to continue to bolster this distinction um, for the differential policy treatments of these two relates to culture and religion. And that is that FGM has no basis in religion, it's just culture, whereas male circumcision is religiously mandated. Now here too there are also problems. Um, first of all, the distinction between religion and culture is quite tenuous in this context. So I'm thinking, for example, um, of many conversations that I've had as a member of the Jewish community um, with Jewish males who I know who have been circumcised and would want to circumcise their children. Um, and the reasons they've given have been extremely diverse. It's not always um, an issue of um, pinpointing a specific part of Genesis or talking about a divine obligation or mandate. Um, often people will talk about the value for them of tradition, um, of continuity um, and a sense of connection with um, an ancient lineage um, or of the importance for them of having their child fit into the community, um, of instilling a particular identity for them. So how does one categorise these kinds of motivations? Are they religious? Are they cultural? Um, it's very hard to really disaggregate. And second of all, even if one could disaggregate between religion and culture in this respect, um, it doesn't seem that there's a particular reason to find one context morally weightier than the other because it may be just as profoundly meaningful and important to a person to carry out a practice on their child that is cultural um, as religious. Um, so why should one be privileged? And finally, even if religion were to be given a special status, such that if a parent said that it was a, um, because of religion that they um, wanted to alter their children's genitals, um, it follows that the circumcision of female as well as male children could be permitted on this basis. And that's because, as Alex Myers has, has said, um, in Sunni Islam, the dominant branch of Islam, two of the four schools of jurisprudence, Shafi'i and Hanbali, consider type one female circumcision to be obligatory, while the other two schools, Maliki and Hanafi, recommend the practice. So in other words, the scriptural support for this is no weaker than for male circumcision. Both are derived from the secondary source of Islamic law known as the Hadith, and neither is to be found in the Quran, which is the primary source of Islamic law. So just to summarise some of the problems with the current policies, they're undermined by the empirical evidence, they're ethically inconsistent, they reflect and reinforce gendered and racialized perceptions of body agency and victimhood, um, as Murray Fox and Michael Thompson have written about. Um, and it all, there is also a question about effectiveness here, that tolerating male circumcision arguably undermines the effectiveness of campaigns to eliminate FGM. Um, and I've got here a quote, um, from Abu Salieh, which says, female circumcision will never stop as long as male circumcision is going on. How, can you, how do you expect to convince an African father to leave his daughter uncircumcised as long as you let him do it to his son? So there are all kinds of problems here with the current policies. But what could possible future policies look like? Well, what if instead of male versus female and instead of religion versus culture, there was consensual versus non-consensual? So in other words, the focus really was on a child's interest in bodily autonomy and self-determination when it comes to extremely personal, permanent psychosexual decisions. And that instead of talking about male circumcision on the one hand and female genital mutilation on the other, we instead change the language and start talking about the non-therapeutic genital alterations that are performed on minors. Now, the question then, beyond a linguistic change and a reconceptualization of a paradigm, would be, well, what would these alternative policies actually look like? 
And there's a question here about equalizing up or down. Um, so as Rob Darby put it earlier this year, he said there are two obvious ways to even up the score. You can increase the level of protection that's accorded to boys, or you can decrease the level of protection that's accorded to girls. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk, for, talk through four possible approaches that would either equalize up or down and what the advantages and disadvantages of those would be. So first of all, I want to talk about toleration by type. So what this would mean is extending the current toleration of male non-therapeutic infant genital alteration to infant females in the form of a, quote, least worst type of female genital alteration, a de minimis vulva nick. So a prick um, in the vulva area, uh, area of an infant female. Now, this was originally proposed by the bioethicist Dina Davis in 2001. It was taken up briefly by the American Association of Pediatrics Bioethics Committee, who then subsequently backed down on this after the um, outrage that was caused. And more recently, however, it was proposed by um, Alan Jacobs and Kavita Aurora in the Journal of Medical Ethics, and it garnered quite a lot of media attention. Some of you may have heard about this, read about it. It was covered in The Economist. Um, and what Kavita and Aurora argue here as the advantages of essentially rolling back the current FGM, anti-FGM <coughs> legislation is that these de minimis procedures don't carry long-term medical risks because they're minimally invasive, they're not removing tissue, they're culturally sensitive, um, and they don't discriminate on the basis of gender or violate human rights. So that's their argument for this. But of course, there are problems. First and foremost, it would be a backward step in the protection of girls. Um, and it would certainly dilute what currently is a very strong moral stance condemning FGM. It would also remove a tool from dissenters within communities um, and reformers and activists outside communities who were trying to eliminate FGM. There's also a question about whether or not it's possible for FGM to be minor, um, and that applies on both a symbolic level and on a physiological level. So symbolically, some would argue that any change, alteration to a female's genitalia is itself as man a manifestation of this patriarchal drive to control female sexuality. And therefore, symbolically, it's just um, inherently harmful. Um, there's also an issue of more invasive procedures under the guise of de minimis procedures. Ten minutes. Um, so in other words, um, if a young girl was taken uh, to have a vulva nick conducted, um, who, who would be able to prevent a more um, extensive procedure from taking place? Who would be monitoring these procedures to make sure only the right amount of tissue um, was incised, damaged or removed? And there's also an issue of false gender parity here, because quite clearly, removing the male foreskin um, is much more extensive than a nick um, to the female vulva, because foreskin removal involves taking away highly innovated um, and sensitive erotogenic tissue, which her vulva nick does not. So this is not, in fact, gender equality. Another approach could be toleration by age. So that would be essentially to introduce an age of consent um, for male and female genital alteration. And one can debate what that age of consent should be, and it was very interesting earlier to think about Gaelic competency in this regard when Jackie was speaking. Um, Brian and I in our conversations were sort of thinking about something along the lines of a sort of a two-year staggering from the age of sexual consent, um, so in the context of the United Kingdom with an age of consent of 16, say 18 could be an age of consent for genital alteration, and the reason behind that is because there needs to be time to enable an individual to figure out what the value for, for them is of their, their um, genital and particular parts of it before they're able to consent to removing it. Um, so the consequences here would be that both girl and boy children would be protected um, and that um, one could eradicate the current um, double standard, arguably a racial double standard, whereby um, adult women of colour, as you were talking about earlier, are prevented from altering their genitals um, if they give reasons of um, custom or uh, ritual for doing so, while um, white women essentially who argue that they want to have um, aesthetic changes on their genitals are given permission to do so. So that would be eradicated by introducing an age of consent and not limiting by type. The advantages, gender equality um, and an age of consent is already a specific mechanism of regulation. 
The problems here are that some types of genital alterations are arguably inherently problematic, and I'm thinking here in particular of infibulation. That is currently type 3 um, FGM, according to the WHO and the UN, um, and that's when the vaginal orifice um, is sewed up. And the problem there is that from a physiological point of view, um, it leads to lots of infections um, because of menstrual blood um, and urine gathering, um, as well as problems in childbirth that increase maternal and infant mortality. Um, and there's arguably a problem symbolically as well. And some people would say that because of the cultural pressures and cultural conditioning, um, how could any woman be free to consent to having her um, vagina infibulated? That that is simply an impossibility. <coughs> Um, one res yeah, so, so as Moira Dustin has pointed out, one response might be it's possible for women to freely choose to go through such a painful experience that women in the situation must be under pressure to conform for fear of social stigma or rejection by their husband or community. But as she also points out, and this ties in exact exactly with your work on female genital cosmetic surgery, that social pressure is not incomparable to that on Western women who have had their vaginas tightened to conform to their society's ideal of what normal genitalia look like. And while the consent of the FGM C victim is irrelevant in the UK, regardless of age, cosmetic surgery for adult women is legal and reported to be a growing market. A third approach is restriction. And what that would mean essentially is extending the restriction that currently exists on all types of female non-therapeutic genital alteration, irrelevant of age, um, to males, including infant males undergoing both routine neonatal circumcision and religious circumcision. So here, both girl and boy children would be protected, and also adult men and women would be protected from cultural conditioning or coercion that could lead them to want to alter their genitals. The advantages are gender equality, um, and that both the culturally familiar and unfamiliar practices would be treated equally, given the same moral and legal um, treatment. And it would likely be welcomed um, by intactivists and communal dissenters to have this kind of blanket ban. The problems here, as I'm sure many of you are aware of, fall into two categories, really. First of all, there's unintended and undesirable consequences. So in other words, a practice that currently is unregulated but not criminalized male circumcision could be pushed further underground, meaning that, let's say, for example, a child hemorrhaged after the procedure, the parents and other people in the community might be very disincentivized to seek medical attention for fear of prosecution. Um, and there could be a, a scenario, um, like for example happened in Kenya when the British tried to um, ban circumcision, where adolescents will take it upon themselves to self-induce cutting, um, which could put them at more risk. Perhaps the bigger issue though, is that this kind of, res of restriction without any kind of exemption for religious minorities practicing circumcision could be perceived and or experienced as religious insensitivity and particularly as a form of anti-Semitism or Islamophobia. The consequence of that, and we've seen this in action, is that there could be a counterproductive backlash that results in the ring fencing of male infant circumcision specifically for reasons of religion or ritual. And we've seen that happening in Cologne in 2012 um, with the court ruling there that um, male infant circumcision was a criminal offence, um, resulting in the German Bundestag six months later actually ring-fencing um, religious circumcision. And similarly, the male genital mutilation bill in San Francisco in the same year um, resulted in similar ring-fencing. There are also questions here about effectiveness from a policy point of view, um, about the effectiveness of a top-down um, legislative approach. Um, in the absence of cultural readiness um, and attitudinal changes within communities that are practicing um, genital alteration, it's unlikely um, that this kind of legislation would result in actual behavioral change. And we've seen that in relation to FGM. Criminalisation is also not preventative, um, though, of course, um, legislative statements and acts can send extremely powerful moral messages that can act um, to prevent um, behaviour. But in technical fact, they um, act ex post. Um, and as I mentioned, if laws with stiff penalties haven't prevented FGM from taking place even in developed Western countries, they're hardly likely to arrest it in its countries of origins. So the final approach is regulation. 
Um, and this can encompass a whole variety of different measures that could, over time, um, incentivize people within communities that currently engage in genital alteration to um, desist. And that could involve regulations that relate to the procedure when it's taking place, so insisting um, on information sheets, for example, myth-busting uh, inf information sheets and consent forms, just to make parents think twice um, in the moment that they're there, that they're consenting to have their child cut. Um, more broadly, there could be education campaigns, engagement with communities, encouragement of non-surgical um, rituals. So I'm thinking here particularly in the Jewish community of um, encouraging Brit Shalom um, as a non-surgical alternative to Brit Mila, encouraging moral debate and gathering data. Um, and also in addition to that, and this goes back to what Paul Mason was saying this morning, um, trying to remove financial, particularly state support um, for these procedures um, and potentially moderating the existing penalties as well, away from fines and custodial sentences um, towards education, counselling, community service, those kinds of things. The advantages here are that in the short term, harm could be minimised while respecting cultural preferences, and that this would be a relatively voluntary and organic, from the bottom up, grassroots policy approach. The problems are that it fails to overcome fundamental issues of a lack of consent um, to a non-therapeutic procedure on the part of the child. It undermines the child's autonomy, their rights to bodily integrity and genital autonomy. And of course, this kind of educational change takes a long time to take effect and numerous children will be cut in the interim. So what is the solution here? Well, it's not easy or straightforward. Um, no approach can resolve the problem really to everybody's satisfaction. And I think here what's really important, particularly for the activists in this room who are thinking about um, reaching out to policymakers or lobbying policymakers, it's important to distinguish between ideal and desirable changes in the long run, and then what might be an achievable change right now. Um, and I think that perhaps one way of going forward would be to take elements from each of these four approaches as follows. From toleration, I think on balance, that all types of adult women's genital alteration should and could be tolerated, um, whether they're women of colour or white women, and for whatever reasons they, they give for the alteration, on the basis that they are sufficiently informed of the risks and consequences and disabused um, of myths that might relate to the cutting, both in a cultural sense and a psychological sense. In terms of regulation, it seems that um, policymakers should be mandating at this point um, the extensive range of regulations um, that I highlighted above, and in particular, uh, um, uh, urgency would be introducing information sheets and consent forms and beginning to gather data um, for practices that right now are literally often happening, as in the case of my younger brother, um, in one's parents' living room um, without any kind of oversight whatsoever. And finally, in relation to restriction, it seems on balance given the current cultural context, given the recent history, that in time and only after there is cultural readiness and attitudinal change should non-therapeutic male genital alteration be restricted to adults only. Thank you very much.